Our society, our culture, has a paradoxical view about achievement. We love individuals who overcome adversity to gain success. Think about David and Goliath. David, a young, inexperienced boy who was somewhat small, against Goliath, a seasoned veteran of battle who was a giant. And yet David overcame, and we love it when individuals overcome such adversity like that. But at the same time, we also love the underdogs, right? And to me, underdogs are usually not just one person. It's usually a team. And, and one of the biggest uh, teams, the achievements of overcoming a giant, I think, is this third Super Bowl when the New York Jets overcame the Baltimore Colts, all right? Now, some, you gotta, some of you got to know the history, all right? You got to know a little sports history. That's been called the biggest upset in team history. They came together, the New York Jets, a rival league to the NFL at that time, and they overcame the seasoned veterans of the Baltimore Colts. We do much the same thing at church, only we combine the two. The individual serving God, but yet we serve God together. We come together as a team local church, Second Baptist Church, and of course the bigger team of Christians all throughout the world. But God has called us into this local community of faith, and we serve individually, we serve as a team. And that's what our writer of Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 is addressing. So if you have your Bibles, we want to look there this morning, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1, to take this one verse to see how we have been called as partners to serve God in his kingdom. Let's stand at the reading of God's word as is our custom here at Second Baptist Church in honor of the word. Hebrews 3 verse 1 says, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. You may be seated. Well, just a few points before we get to our conclusion here. So here's how we're going to walk through the sermon this morning. We're going to be fixing our minds on Jesus and what that looks like and what that can be, how that can be lived out specifically. And then after that, this is going to, the next point will be the main focus of my sermon, working with one another as partners. And then once we do that, we'll come to the third point, seeing the eternal importance of the results, and then we get to the conclusion. Hopefully, we'll be able to conclude this. The conclusion is that you need to join with the work. Join the work. So let's look at the beginning at fixing our minds on Jesus. That is our task as individuals at Second Baptist Church. That's the task of anyone who's put his or her faith in Jesus Christ, to fix your eyes on Jesus, to orient your life around Jesus Christ, and to live this life for Jesus. That's implied in that phrase. This means that each one of us are supposed to develop as disciples. You're supposed to grow. I've told you many times, salvation is not a ticket to heaven. Now, it's a great byproduct for salvation, okay? I'm not against heaven, okay? i plan to be there one day, at least, you know, Lord willing. But that's not the main thing. The main thing is following Jesus in relationship with God. And so that's our desire. I want to follow Jesus more consistently in my life. I want to follow Jesus more intimately in my life. I want to be more successful according to God's definition of success and standards. And what I need, and you know what I need, is I need your help to do that. I need you to help me to follow after Jesus Christ. And I'll let you in on a little secret that I know about you. You need my help and everybody else's help at Second Baptist Church. And so now we've gone beyond the individual and we've come together as partners in what we're doing. We share in this together here. We develop. That's what, that's what our mission statement is, and it's just the Great Commission reworded a bit. God uses 2BC to develop disciples of Jesus Christ. That is our calling. Now, that sounds good, right? Nobody's, nobody's booing me so far. Nobody's saying that's crazy, Pastor. 
but what does it mean, all right? How do we live that? How do we live by fixing our eyes on Jesus? And I think there's several things, and there's nothing earth-chattering. I've shared with you before, and I'll do it again. How do we fix our eyes and our minds, our whole lives on Jesus individually and come together to do it as a group? Three things that we do. We begin, first of all, by learning what Jesus taught so that we may live obediently to him. So I want to know what Jesus taught in order to live obediently to him. And we all can learn. One of the best times I have in gathering with to be seers, that's you, by the way, okay, is Wednesday night Bible study. Because in Wednesday night Bible study, invariably, at least one of you or several of you are going to come up with something that I hadn't thought about before, or yes, that I didn't know before, or give me a new insight I hadn't thought about before. It's also the reason why I enjoy from time to time teaching a Sunday school class. Sunday school teachers, you know, hey, I can fill in from time to time. Now, I can't fill in for you every week because then I would be your Sunday school teacher, and you know, God has that spot for you. But, you know, I love filling in because there is always someone in class that asks a question or makes a comment, and I learn from that. Folks, we fix our eyes on Jesus by learning what he taught so we can be obedient to that, and we teach that to one another. Second thing that we do is that we want to determine what he did so that we can do the same things that Jesus did. Now, don't press this too hard. It doesn't mean that we all have to move to Galilee and make frequent trips down to Jerusalem, all right? No, that's, that's not what we're to do. What it means is that we're to look at Jesus in his life and we are to follow what he did. What did he do? He helped people. To those who were sick, he went and visited and brought healing to them. Folks, just your presence can be healing to folks who are sick and encouragement to them. For those in prison, we visit them and encourage them. For those demon-possessed, you know what? Have you ever met somebody who's confused, doesn't know up from down which way to go and all of that? Yeah. <laughs> if you haven't met anybody like that, get a new mirror, okay? Yeah, they're right in the mirror there. We need to help give guidance and point people to Jesus and point people to the truth, ultimately pointing to the salvation that Jesus offers on the cross. We've always got to get to the cross. We've got to get there for salvation. We get to the cross. We get to the tomb. We get to the resurrection of Jesus. And then the third thing that we do, the third way that we fix our eyes on Jesus, after learning what he taught and discerning what he did, folks, what we need to do after that is to ascertain his attitude. What was the attitude that Jesus did all of this with? Jesus' attitude is what we want our attitudes to be. Y'all know the old joke. People ask Kathy, do you wake up grumpy in the morning? And she says, no, I let him sleep, all right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't think Jesus ever woke up grumpy. I think Jesus was very busy. I don't think he was in a hurry. I don't think he was ever in a hurry. That's a lesson for us. But I think he was incredibly busy, and I think he had some very tiring days. But the next morning, I imagine there were some mornings that were hard to get up, but I don't envision him ever being grumpy. And the time that he was really upset, it was with purpose in the temple as he overturned the money changer's table. He was in control of what he was doing and very purposeful in what he did. So that's what we're to do. So, all right, so how do we get there, Pastor? You know, it would be great if we had had a book about things that Jesus taught and things that he did and the attitude with which he did it. But we don't have a book. We have four books that tell us all of that, don't we? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so you need to be in the Gospels regularly, all right? Now, folks, my PhD is in biblical studies, focus on the Old Testament. But I'm telling you, yes, focus on the Gospels. I'm a Christian, all right? And I love being in the Psalms. But if you really want to know Jesus the best, you fixate on those Gospels. Read the rest of the Bible too, including the Old Testament, by the way. But to know Jesus, it's in the Gospels. 
drink those in as well and very much in your biblical reading and study. So that's how we fix our minds. Next, we want to work with one another as partners. Work with one another. Our, our verse says, holy brothers and sisters who share. The, the word share is kind of more of like a verb, but in the Greek, it's really a noun. They've changed it into a verb for making it smooth translation. The word means partner. We're partners. The, the Greek word is metakoi for partners, the plural. We share in a heavenly calling. We share in being able, yes, we can come before God. We have our great high priest. We still have a high priest, by the way. That's what Hebrews talks about. Jesus is our high priest. That's why you don't have to bring sacrifices to me, right? You know I would, well, I would, bad, you know I would, I can't, I've got to go there. I'm sorry, dear. You know I would butcher it, right? I'm sorry, bad pun. I had to go there, all right? Yes, you know I would butcher the sacrifice. So, no, Jesus is our great high priest, isn't he? And we share in the calling of doing heavenly things here on this earth. We serve together. And it's an active calling. You've heard of the companies, you know, Smith and Jones. And Mr. Smith does all the work and Mr. Jones just has his name on the nameplate, right? No, we all do the work. We all serve our great God together. And folks, we've been hearing about the testimonies. We began hearing about broken chains, a recovery, a recovery group and, and really ministry that's incredible in what they do. And Robert Reed, as he leads it, folks, some of you are on the board, folks who've had lifestyle issues, I've seen healing through broken chains. Part of what you give in your gifts to this church, we pass on to broken chains. You've heard the testimonies about the Baptist Student Ministries. All right, part of your gifts go to the Baptist Student Ministries. And in Texas Baptist work, student ministry is the number one position ministry of seeing people come to Jesus Christ in salvation. And so part of what you give goes directly to that. Yes, what else do we see? We hear about prison ministry as well. Folks who, well, we would love for them to come, but we understand and we want them to stay where they are for right now, right? Yes, all right. So we, if they can't come, we're going to go to them. And we're going to minister to them. And you support that work as well. And yes, we expect God, don't you remember Miracle Sunday? We expect God to work in miraculous ways, don't we? That's what we want to see. Evangelism. Whenever we tell people about Jesus, sometimes there's money involved. Folks, very early on, within the first couple of sermons I gave back in the end of 2007 when I came to be pastor here, I told you that ministry was a church code word that means it cost money, okay? Ministry cost money. And then on top of that, Tim Miller, bless his heart, gets up here and talks about how the building takes money too. I mean, what's that, right? I mean, that's not glamorous, that's not awe-inspiring, but it is necessary, isn't it? It is very necessary. And as one another, we partner serving our great God. So, yes, we're talking about giving. I expect you to give your money. I expect you to give your time. I expect you to give your prayers. All with one another for Second Baptist Church as we serve and do God's kingdom work. Now, if I'm preaching on giving, you know your bulletin has a number on it. It has a number on the back, just like mine does. Mine is number 174. I have already randomly, I didn't do it, the computer website I did, I told it to generate 20 random numbers, one to 225. And when I looked down at them, 174, the number I have, it wasn't a winner, all right? So Kathy and I, we are, uh, we're going to give a gift. We can't win. Staff can't win either, sorry. So if you don't have a bulletin, well, now you've learned that you need to get a bulletin, and you may want to run back there and go get one, all right? Oh, would somebody go get me a bulletin real quick? Actually, get me four or five of them, okay, if there's enough back there. 
every every time I give a gift. Last fall, I, I preached about this, and I, I gave on give. I preached on giving, and I gave a gift, and and I, evidently I didn't explain well enough. Somebody asked me about why I do it. Why, Pastor, did you give a gift? And I'm going to give you some reasons why I do this. First of all, giving is fun, isn't it? Amen. Giving is fun. Now, okay, when I was five. Getting was a lot more fun than giving. I'll understand that, okay? But then you get a little older, and it's like, you know what? I'm just, I don't need any more stuff. I just want to give. That's what I want to do. And so giving is fun. Kathy and I have a lot of fun doing this every, every time I preach on giving. Second reason is to show you that, that Kathy and I want to partner with you that where you're at to demonstrate that, yes, we are partners. Because right now, folks, I tell you, how, families, I don't know how you do it. I know, I know how hard it was for Kathy and me when we had kids in the home, and with inflation and the grocery store prices going up, I don't know how you do it. I'm in awe of that. But we want to give you something that will help you, whoever wins, family or an individual, we want to help you and we want to bless you. And third reason that we do this is that we want to demonstrate that we can all give something. We all need to be willing to give something because you know, everything that I have isn't mine. I didn't steal it. God loaned it to me. God loaned me everything I have. All my possessions, he's loaned me all the money. He's loaned me, he loaned me my wife because she's his first. Loaned me my boys. They're his first. And so what I do with what God owns, I've been entrusted with that. And I want to demonstrate that we can share with one another, all in service to God's kingdom. All right. Oh, yeah. Old Testament talks about 10%. Let me go here. Let me go here before we give away. Oh, well, I know I have your attention. I haven't given any numbers yet, right? Get to the number, Pastor. Well, listen to this, all right? I know the Old Testament 10% stuff. Jesus didn't come to reaffirm, hey, you know what? Do everything that the law says in the Old Testament. That's not what he came for. He came to solve our sin problem so that we can have salvation and enjoy eternal life from the moment we believe for all eternity. What about the 10%? Pastor, I can't give 10%. Well, you know what? That's where I need you to pray. If you have a spouse, pray with your spouse. How much do we need to give? Because it's all God's money anyway. And I believe that by next year or two, if you're not giving 10%, son of a gun, look at that. That number's gotten up to 10%. And if you keep doing that, it's going to go over 10%. Now, here's the other thing for some of you other folks, all right? Some of you other folks, I need to remind you that 10% is not an upper limit, all right? I'm giving all I can, Pastor. That's all I can give, 10%. No, 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 no. There are folks who can give way more, and there are already folks who are giving more. And so some of you, God has really blessed. And so, yes, you need to join in the work even more. And I don't know who gives what. I don't look at the records at all. I don't want to know who gives what. Plus, along with that, it's, you know, it takes a lot of investigating to find out who gives all of what, okay? I'm not willing to spend the time to do it. But some can give considerable. You won't be alone in doing that. Give because what this church does matters. It makes a difference. And I've seen God use what this church does to change lives because he's working through us. All right. Let's give it away, all right? Let me find my notes here. Kathy, come on up here. What are we giving away? You want, you're, I think you're going to want this. Actually, whenever I call out the winning number, we got, we got second place, too. We've got two prizes, all right, to give to you. So there's the first one. This is for the second service, number 12. Does anybody have number 12 and willing to admit it? All right. How about 90. 81, gave a lot of two-digit ones here. 81, we got 81 up there? You got 81? All right, Destiny. Sit down. You got $500 in that envelope. All right. Take mom out to eat for lunch, okay? All right, yeah. Well, you everybody hit, hey, I have a loan? All right. The second gift is not $500, but when you hear about it, you will think that, man, that, that would be a tough choice, all right? So let's get our second winner. Number 33 is next. 
All right, 126. Anybody? 50. 50? Barbara, you get it. All right. Barbara, what we have for you is we have a half a gallon of Bluebell's new flavor, which happens to be A&W Root Beer Float, just released this week. And so aren't you glad that I made that choice for you? $500 or ice cream? Yeah, that's a tough one right there. I understand that. It's in the big freeze in the, uh, the church's kitchen. All right. Meet you in the kitchen. You know what? Again, what was the, what was the reason why, one of the reasons we, we do this is because it's fun. And when you give your gifts to the church, whether it's money or time, God, what are you going to do with this? Because you're going to do something great, I know. All right. We got more sermon to go, all right? We're almost there. Seeing the eternal importance of the results, right? Paul referred to our upward calling in many places and we have all been called. And we're called to follow the apostle. Jesus is called apostle here. An apostle is a sent one. Jesus is sent to come here. He is our high priest, the end of verse one that we read here this morning. Folks, what are the things of eternal importance? I'll ask you a question here. I think I know the answer, though. When you graduated high school or when you turned 18, how many of you sat down and thought, you know what I have to do before I do anything else? I must plan out my retirement. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think anybody did. My thought was, yeah, retirement, yeah, that's for old folks, yeah, yeah. Hopefully you will plan for your retirement before your retirement. Otherwise, you will not be retiring, okay? That's just the way that that works. Now, let me ask this next question. Some of you may have done this, but I imagine most of us didn't. How many of us, when you graduated high school or when you turned 18, sat down, you know what? I want to plan out my investments that I'm going to put up in heaven right now. I didn't do that. Because heaven, when, when, when are we going to heaven, folks? We all have heard the preachers that say, you may not make it home tonight. You know what? Chances are we're all going to get home, okay? And we don't think years, most of us think decades. That's decades away before I see that. And that's the wrong approach about thinking about investing in heaven. We invest in heaven by following Jesus today, by letting him lead us into service, into giving, into ministry each and every day. And when we do that, how about that? We're investing in heaven without even thinking about it. Because we walk with Jesus each and every day. That's the call that's been put upon us. And we do that as individuals, and we do that as Second Baptist Church, as a local community of faith. So folks, join the work. That's what we want to be doing. Come and join the work. That's what I want you to do. To support all of these ministries, yes, Ministries cost money. The building costs a lot of money, all right? I need your time. I need your prayers. We all need each other's time and prayers, and we can give that. In Acts chapter 4, I'll close with a story there that we're somewhat familiar with, but it's given in two verses. We don't realize how short it is. The setup is this, the early church. The early church... They brought things together and they shared with those who had need. This was not an early form of communism, okay? Communism is when the government says everything that you own is ours, all right? And it's funny how there's always somebody in the government in charge, and whenever they say what you have is ours, they kind of keep it for themselves, don't they? That's, that's called sin. Every form of government is really, I think, trying to figure out how to deal with the sin problem. I think democracy is probably the best way, all right? But the early church, what they did was that when somebody over here had a need and somebody over here had a surplus, the person over here said, you know what, I'm going to share with the person in need. And it's really not giving up or sacrificing because what you're giving isn't yours, is it? It's God's. And when somebody online has a need, somebody in the middle may have some surplus and they can share with them. Or maybe somebody needs a visit 
and you can spare some time. Pastor, I can't give money, but you know what? I can make a visit. All right, why don't you go see this person here? They could use a visit. They could use a prayer from you. And this is how we come together. Where does it begin? It begins by giving your life to Jesus Christ. It begins by saying, Lord, I believe in you and I want eternal life. And folks, when you do that, you are giving your life. That's why salvation is free, but it'll cost you everything. It's free. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. But when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he is now your boss. He is your Lord. He is your master. You will do what he says. Otherwise, in what way are you really a Christian? You're just looking for a ticket to heaven, and God doesn't sell those. So you give your life to Jesus. You believe in him. You put your faith in him. And then, yes, it is extremely important to join a local church because we expect one another to share and be partners. Yeah, you're in Second Baptist Church, we expect you to serve. We expect to see you. And so come join our church. And God has put a call on every one of us to serve, some in special ways, but a call for everyone to serve, and that's what we're to do. So this morning, what we're going to do is I'm going to have you stand. I'm going to pray with you in a moment. Our praise team will be back up here, and we're going to sing. And as we sing, I want to invite you to come forward. Some of you may need to come forward for prayer. We want to pray with you. Your staff will be up here at the front. Some of you may want to come forward and say, I want to join the church. I want to be a part of Second Baptist Church. Some of you may want to come forward and say, I want to know Jesus and what it's about to know Jesus as my Savior. We encourage you to come forward as well. And online, you can reach out to us through Facebook or through our phone number. But church right now, what's your choice? What's God calling you to do right now? Let's stand for our word of prayer. Lord God, thank you for giving us such a great salvation, for redeeming us, for bringing us into your family in full so that we can be partners in serving with one another. Lord, the call upon us to serve is a blessing. May we heed that call. But it begins by putting our faith in you. There are those that need to do that this day, to call out to you as Savior. Bring them forward to pray with the staff member, but Lord, we will teach them to pray to you to ask for that great salvation. Others need a church home. They need that accountability, Lord, as we all do, to serve faithfully. Lord, Bring them forward to join this church. Others have special calls on their lives to serve your kingdom. The church wants to know about that and pray with them about that. Lord, may we all recognize the importance of this partnership we have in you to serve you as our great God in Jesus' name. Amen.